This is part two of lecture 11. So in the first part of the lecture, we talked about the many reasons that we have to help others. Still, we don't often uh, or don't always decide to actually offer help when a person is in need. So what are the determinants of uh, uh, this deciding basically to help others? Well, this decision to help others is really depending on two factors. I think you, by, by now you should know what these two factors are. It's the person in combination with the situation. So let's first start looking into aspects of the person. There are some people that have an altruistic personality, and these are people that have a very high need and desire to help others, like Mother Teresa you see over here. She really has this very deep desire to selfishly help people that are in need. And I think you can also all relate to this, that some people just are very helpful as a personality trait, way more than others. Um, but there's also, apart from personality, other aspects of a person that um, are influential on the decision to help others. Let's zoom into another uh, fa a factor of a person, and that is gender. There is some sort of stereotype that women tend to be more helpful than men. That's based on the sort of the stereotypical view that women are more caring, more responsible, uh, uh, are more social, and therefore are more likely to help others. Is this true? Yes or no? I'm curious what your intuition is about this. Well, the answer to the question is, it depends. Uh, men and women can both be very helpful, but the, the, the ways in which they offer help, so the moments they decide to help, really depends on gender roles. So we all are pretty much familiar with the gender roles that are associated with uh, the gender that we identify with. So if you identify as female, there's this stereotypical be belief that we should offer help when a person needs to be cared for. For example, when there's a baby crying or when somebody falls down or, or maybe there's an old neighbor that needs groceries, then we are likely to offer help to those people in need. Um, males also, or men can also uh, have this tendency to help others, but then more when there's sort of a stereotypical need for men to be uh, in power or powerful, for example, carrying bags of a female that is walking by, so uh, sort of uh, demonstrating their strength. And it's not to say that we are inherently so, but it's just because we are made aware so often of the behaviors that we are supposed to demonstrate. So we know that men are supposed to be, you know, reveal how strong they are and show that and therefore offer help uh, to uh, the weaker uh, humans in society. I'm laughing because it's ridiculous. But uh, so... So they know that they're expected to be showing helpful behavior uh, if uh, other people are uh, in need of uh, them to demonstrate their strength. So gender uh, plays a role. Uh, something else that plays a role is uh, mood. We already talked about mood in the first part of the lecture. So the mood that you're temporary in can, uh, can influence your decision to help. Uh, what also is very important is the person that you're offering help to. And basically, there's two types of people if you look at uh, the people that you can offer help to. Yep, you, uh, you can help people from your in-group or you can help people from your out-group. And with in-group, I refer to uh, the people that are part of your own group, the group that you, ident you personally identify with. This can be your family members, it can be students at your own university, any group that you feel related to, that is part of your personal identity. So oftentimes we offer help to in-group members because we want to benefit the group, so it's good for, for the group's well-being. And also we tend to experience more empathy if a person that is part of our group is in need of help. So if a family member needs help or someone that you uh, that is part of the group, uh, maybe a sports group that you're uh, also part of, then we offer help because of empathic uh, reasons, so more altruistic help, basically. If a person from an out group uh, is in need of help, uh, that's a person that is not part of your group, that is not oftentimes a stranger, someone you don't identify with, you don't share anything with, with then we can still offer help, but we, we are more likely to help this person if it's also out of our self-interest, so if it benefits us uh, in some sort of way. We are less likely to experience empathy and therefore overall less less likely to help uh, members from out group, um, from groups that are not part of us. Um, so uh, one other factor that is, I think, quite interesting is the location that you're at. 
uh, research has showed and also uh, anecdotal evidence that people uh, from rural areas, so if you live, uh, uh, for example, on the countryside, are more helpful than people that live in urban areas, so in big cities. And this is something that has been demonstrated quite a lot, and there's also quite some discussion on why this is the case. Uh, is this the case that people from a countryside are just more pleasant, are friendlier at the very core, have different personalities than people in cities? Well, that turns out to be uh, completely false. So it's not the case that people uh, in cities have, uh, have less uh, positive or pleasant personalities than people in, in villages. But uh, the most likely explanation is, is that if you live in a city, uh, there's a lot going on. So you, you can be pretty overwhelmed by all the factors, the noise, all the people in the city. You, so you can feel pretty overwhelmed by it. And you also feel like there are so many people, you cannot help everyone. So what happens then is that you experience urban overloads. And according to the urban overload hypothesis, we experience more stress in cities and therefore we become less likely to help. So also if you move people from a village to a city, uh, then you also see that they become less likely to help than uh, when they were still living in that village. So this question of whether people in a village are more helpful than people in cities was actually also one of the key questions of an episode of a Dutch television program called Who Do You Think You Are? It's a popular science uh, television program that I was also part of as a, as a scientific expert. And in this uh, episode, uh, there was a comparison made between people from villages and cities. And the key question was, are people in the village uh, more or less uh, likely to help uh, others? So uh, you can now take a look uh, to this part of the show. Goed, en dan komen we eigenlijk bij de misschien wel de belangrijkste vraag van vandaag. Kijk, we hebben soms het idee dat mensen in, in een dorpje dat die, gewoon, dat die gewoon wat aardiger zijn dan mensen uit de grote stad. Ja. Gewoon vriendelijker, gewoon geïnteresseerder. Ze groeten naar elkaar. Ja, ja. dus dat, dat wilden we graag onderzoeken. Dat hebben we gedaan in ons experiment. Zijn dorpelingen aardiger dan stedelingen? Zijn dorpelingen aardiger dan stedelingen? Tja, hoe meet je dat? We hadden wat bedacht, een list. Dit is Eva, onze labassistent. Eva is kerngezond, maar had voor het experiment een brace omgedaan... en een zielig verhaal klaar over een gebroken middenvoetsbeentje. We gaven haar krukken en het zag er allemaal heel geloofwaardig uit. Ben je ook echt gewond? Of is dat, uh... Nee, ja, ik heb met, met, ben met basketbal iemand op mijn voet gesprongen. Ik heb deze week mijn uh, middenvoetsbeentje gebroken met basketbal. De proefpersonen waren daar om een vragenlijst in te vullen over hun leeftijd. Ik heb hier een vragenlijst. Ik wil graag dat je die invult. Je mag hier invullen in voor- en achternaam. Even omcirkelen dorp of stad. En deze zes vragen over leeftijd. Die vragenlijst had verder niks met dit onderzoek te maken. Het ging ons namelijk om iets anders. Wie zijn aardiger? En aardig zijn splitsten we op in twee vragen. Wie is er behulpzamer naar Eva en wie is er empathischer? Dus wie leeft het meeste met haar mee? We begonnen met de behulpzaamheid. We hadden gezorgd dat Eva een pen had die het niet goed deed... en dus moest onze arme Eva opstaan, haar krukken pakken... en naar een doos met pennen lopen. Doet de pen het niet? Wacht, ik ga even een andere pen. Hij doet het niet, dacht nee. Ik ga even een andere voor je pakken, een moment. Onze eerste meting was... wie vraagt of ze Eva misschien even kunnen helpen bij het pakken van de pen? Onze dorpelingen waren behoorlijk hulpvaardig. Wat doet hij het niet? Wacht, ik ga even... Nee. Ik, heb een, ik heb een andere pen, een moment. Ik ook. Hm? Nee, 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 komt goed, dank je. Oh, moet ik er? Nee, 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 dank je, komt goed, hoor, komt goed. Moet ik er dan nog aan? Nee, 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 komt goed. Wat zeg, moet ik hem pakken voor jou? Nee, dat hoef ik niet. Maar ook de stedelingen lieten zich niet onbetuigd. Komt goed. Moet ik hem pakken? Nee. Goed pakken. Nee, 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 ik heb het al hier. Zo kan ik gaan? Nee, 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 dat gaat helemaal goed. Maar wel veel minder vaak. Van de stedelingen boden maar vijf van de twintig hulp aan tegenover tien van de dorpelingen. Een stuk minder behulpzaam dus. Maar nu het onderzoek naar meelevendheid, de empathie. We keken wie er uit zichzelf aan Eva vroeg wat er in vredesnaam met haar gebeurd was. Ja, er is met basketbal iemand tijdens de training op mijn voet gesprongen. Wat oh. is er dan? Nou, er is met basketbaltraining iemand op mijn voet gesprongen. Wat heb je gedaan? Ik ben uh, met basketbal is er iemand op mijn voet gesprongen. Hmm, ongelukkig gehad. Ja. Sommigen, met name de mannen, dachten haar te troosten door gelijk over hun eigen ellende te beginnen. Ik heb ook mijn enkel ook gebroken. En ik ben naar mijn huis gereden. Oh. Het is dat ging niet. Oh, ik heb mijn pink al een keer gebroken gehad. Oh. Mijn schouder gebroken. Middenvoetspintje gebroken. Oh echt, dat heb ik ook een keer gehad. Oh echt? Ja, leuk. Ja, Ben, ontzettend leuk. Hier waren de rollen qua vriendelijkheid omgedraaid. 
tien van de stedelingen vroegen uit zichzelf naar de voet en slechts vijf van de dorpelingen. Dus wat vriendelijkheid betreft staat het nu 1-1. Maar we hadden nog meer pijlen op onze boog. Aan het eind van het gesprek kwam Eva genadeloos tevoorschijn met haar ultieme tranentrekker. Kijk, dat is mijn kat, Spik. Wat kan een beetje sneus. <coughs> dat uh, Spik is uh, deze week overleden. Hij is uh, onder de auto van de buurman gekomen. Hey. Sorry dat ik hier misschien een beetje mee overval, maar... De reacties hierop waren nogal wisselend. Laten we beginnen met de hele empathische. Hij uh, lag onder de auto van de buurman te slechten. Echt? Ja, en uh, toen is hij achteruit gereden. Ah, geweldig. Ja. Oh, okay. ja, sorry. Ik, het, is gewoon, het zit zo in mijn hoofd. Ja, dat snap ik. Al oh, heel naar. Ja. Ik vind het zo lullig dat hij dan zo aan zijn eindje moet komen. Ja, het, ja. Wel gecondoleerd. Ja, dank, dank u wel. Ja. Dat is zielig voor de kaart. Ja, voor jou ook. Ja, voor die nee, ja, voor de, ik ook. Hoe oud was je? Een jaar of van mij is vervelend ja. voor je. Dank dat ik het ook wel. Ja, Als je het kwijt moet, ja, kwijt. Nee, ja, nee, ja, zo, dat is ook zo. Ja. Nee, het is gewoon niet. Je moet zo. niet opkroppen, hè? Nee. Dat dus. nee. Jeetje, jullie hebben wel pech hoor. Nou, oh. ja, hij is onder de, onder de auto van de buurman gekomen. Ja, echt zo, zo oh. stom. Wat zielig. Ik heb zelf geen huisdier, maar ik hoor wel vaak van mensen die huisdieren hebben dat het ja, best wel erg is. Dus die toch verliezen. En daar sterkte er mee niet op. Nou, dank je, dat vind ik heel lief. Bedankt dat ik het even mocht vertellen. Ja, zie Sommigen reageren wat aan de korte kant. Ik zeg het een beetje stom, maar hij is uh, deze week uh, uh, overleden, helaas. Oké. Okay. Okay. Mensen. Er zit daar een vrouw van vlees en bloed tegenover jullie die haar voet heeft gebroken. En in dezelfde week is de buurman over haar kat heen gereden. En wat zeggen jullie dan? Dat is van jou, dat is van jou en dat hoort ja, van jou. En het, uh, het is soms dat vind ik heel vervelend voor je, ja. maar dat moet je zelf oplossen. Dat klopt. Ah, dank je Ludo. Dat was denk ik precies wat Eva nodig had. Sommigen vonden het vooral een onsmakelijk verhaal, zoals Marta. Nee, nou, dat, het was en eeuw en echt super verdrietig ook. Maar je hebt ook pijnstillers. Is je kat dood en dan vraag je, heb je pijnstillers? Oké, okay, maar ja, het is beter dan niks, zoals bij sommigen. En uh, ik heb het er best wel moeilijk mee, dus ja. Ja, je ziet Robert John gewoon denken. Ja, zielig verhaal, maar heb je niet nog zo'n puddingbroodje? <lacht> ja, even voor de mensen die de afgelopen weken niet van geslapen hebben. Uh, de kat van Eva leeft nog gewoon. Die hebben we niet opgeofferd voor het experiment, dat hoorde er allemaal bij. Ja, we hebben wel een beetje voor de wetenschap misbruik gemaakt van jullie uh, empathie. Ja. Of althans, empathie, Ludo. <laughs> we, we hadden dus waar een filmpje aan het maken en toen dachten wij van... is het nou chic van ons om jou zo af te schilderen in het filmpje? Dat mag, absoluut. Ja, Geen want probleem. wij dachten inderdaad ook van, dat is van jou. <laughs> nee, inderdaad, dat is voor jou. Dat, dat vinden we jou heel vervelend voor je. Maar dat moet je zelf oplossen. <laughs> dat is jouw verdriet en dat moet je zelf inderdaad verwerken. Ja, dat is... inderdaad, zo werkt dat. Goed, er was, uh, ja, er was bij de dode kat natuurlijk een, een enorme diversiteit aan reacties. Maar wel met een vrij duidelijke uitslag. Want van de stedelingen reageerden er negen van de, van de twintig echt heel empathisch. Echt, die gingen helemaal mee. En, en van de dorpelingen eigenlijk, eigenlijk maar twee. Ja. Er waren er twee waarvan je dacht, ja, daar zit, daar zit hard in de rest. was een beetje plichtmatig of een beetje heel kort. En we hebben het ook aan Eva gevraagd na het experiment. Ze zeiden van, eerlijk zeggen, wie vond je nou aardiger voor jou? Wie vond je meeleverder? En toen zei ze, nou, ik vond toch de stedelingen wel iets aardiger. Ja. Ja. Dus, dus wat, wat vind jij van dit verschil, Tina? Ja, jullie hebben natuurlijk twee verschillende dingen onderzocht. Ja. Hè? Het eerste gedeelte uh, met de pen. Ja. Dat ging echt over behulpzaamheid. En we weten dat, dat dorpelingen in het algemeen wat behulpzamer zijn... naar vreemden en ook naar buren dan stedelingen. Wel een belangrijke toevoeging, dat geldt niet voor familie en vrienden. Uh, stedelingen en dorpelingen die zijn daarin hetzelfde. Dus het is niet dat jullie nooit helpen. Alleen jullie zijn wat kritischer naar wie je helpt. Uh, en het tweede gedeelte, dat ging dus over empathie. Hoe meevoelend ben je? Nou, daar scoorden de stedelingen beter. Het zou ook kunnen komen omdat het hier ging om een huisdier. En we weten dat uh, huisdieren in de stad... hebben ze vooral een sociale functie voor de gezelligheid. En in dorpen zijn huisdieren ook, hebben ook vaak nog wel een praktisch nut. Bijvoorbeeld om een terrein te bewaken of om ongedierte te verjagen. Dus het kan zijn dat, dat dorpelingen ja, wat zakelijker kijken naar zo'n uh, zo dode kat. Meer zo van alsof je stofzuiger kapot is. Of, uh, zo. Dus uh, dat zou ook kunnen verklaren waarom jullie wat meer uh, invoelend zijn geweest. Oké. Okay. Ja. 
So here we already saw that the situation that you're in, and specifically the area where you are living, has an effect on your decision to help. And we are now slowly moving from the person to the situation. So we'll now start exploring situational factors and pressures to help others, yes or no. And in order to clarify this, I will start by, uh, by explaining, I think, a very fun and, and, and clever study that was conducted on uh, students of a seminary. So basically, these are students uh, that want to become a priest. And these were students from Princeton University, and they participated in a study on religious education. And you have to keep in mind that this was on purpose, this group of students, uh, this group of participants, because all these students had a very high motivation to help others. Students from seminary that want to become a priest, of course, they have a very strong attitude that they are supposed to be helping others. This is, of course, core also of their religion. So at the very basis, they were very helpful, uh, helpful individuals with more altruistic personalities. So uh, these people um, all uh, took place in this experiment. And this experiment began in one building, and they filled out several questionnaires, and then ended in a second building where they had to walk to. So at the end of the first part of the experiment, uh, the students were told, can you now please go to the second part of the experiment? Th that's in a different building. And there were three different conditions. In the first condition, uh, the students were told that they were ahead of schedule, so they had plenty of time. The second condition, they were told they are right on schedule, so they don't have to hurry, but also, you know, don't be too slow. And the final condition, they were told you're actually a little bit behind on schedule, uh, so please hurry to go to this uh, second part of the experiment. And then what the researchers were actually interested in, uh, interested in is uh, what students would do when moving from one building to the next. Because in the meantime, they would come across a person that was def definitely in need of help. So the question was, will these students of seminary decide to help the person they come across on their way from one building to the next building? And will this be dependent on situational factors? In this, in, in this case, uh, time pressure. Here, is, uh, here you see the results. And it's an overwhelming uh, response in which you see that people are definitely influenced by uh, pressures of time. So the students uh, that were ahead of schedule, the majority of these students, uh, decided to start helping the person that they came across while the people, people that were told that they were on schedule already had a lower uh, tendency, a lower likelihood of starting to help uh, the person they came across. And if they were told that they were behind on schedule, they stopped, basically stopped uh, offering help to a, people, a, a person in need that they came across. And um, I think this is a very interesting study because it shows uh, that we are all um, uh, basically sort of uh, victims of the situation we find ourselves in. So even if you have a very strong conviction that you should help others, the moment you start feeling pressure or you're in a certain situation in which you feel like I, I'm not in the, in the situation or in the, uh, I don't have the possibility to offer help, we can actually stop showing this helpful behavior. And this study was later replicated with uh, a group of participants that were not from seminary, so a, a, a sort of a more random uh, part of the population. And there were two conditions. Um, in one uh, a group of uh, the participants in this first part of the experiment, they read a story on the Good Samaritan. And this is basically a story about how important it is to offer help to others in need. So basically really sort of being uh, primed with this idea of helping, that helping is very important. The second part uh, of the uh, people uh, read um, uh, a story on job efficiency, so how you can get the job done as quickly as possible. Then again, they had to move to a second building, these three conditions with time pressure, yes or no. Here you see the results. And basically what is interesting is the, gr the yellow bars replicate very nicely what we also find with the students from seminary, like the priest students. So here you see, if you're primed with being helpful, you see that uh, you will help, but only if you feel like uh, you have time to help. So if you're ahead of schedule or on schedule, you're pretty likely to offer help. The moment you start feeling pressure, time pressure, you stop uh, offering help. But if you read a story on job efficiency, it doesn't matter how much time you have, you basically don't help. So this is also something to keep in mind that uh, the way you educate yourself and what you're reading and what you're learning is also really impacting your behavior. Uh, so if you are you know, following a study in which 
some key attributes uh, like helping behavior are, uh, are uh, part of the, your curriculum, then you're more likely to start offering help than uh, if you are always reading stories on how you can be a, a, as efficient as possible. Um, okay, so let me now go to a story in which I think um, the, um, one of the core problems with helping behavior becomes very clear. This is a story, a very famous story of uh, Catherine Genovese, or Kitty Genovese. And uh, she was uh, um, a woman, a young woman, uh, living in New York City, so an urban area, in 1964. And this was a very sad tale of, of Kitty Genovese because she uh, came home in the middle of the night at uh, 2.30 a.m. and she was attacked by a man with a knife. She started screaming and shouting. She lives in a big apartment building. A lot of people were there or were at least in the building. So she started shouting for help. The lights went on and someone uh, also shouted, leave her alone. So clearly having heard the circumstances and, and being aware that there was a person in need. Then the man disappeared, the man with the knife disappeared. The lights in the building went off. Then the man came back before Kitty could enter the building. Um, she started shouting again for help. Uh, lights in the building went back on, but the man killed her. And only um, after quite a while, uh, more than one hour, the first call to the police was made. And um, in the first, uh, uh, when this first appeared in the news, it was of course very shocking that a young, a young girl was murdered. Uh, unfortunately, this is not something that is very uh, remarkable in a big city like New York. But what, what was remarkable about this story was that a lot of people actually heard what was going on. There were, uh, according to the first um, uh, uh, newspaper articles, around 38 th uh, to 40 people that actually heard that this was going on, that this was happening. They were in their building and basically did nothing. Um, later on, this, was, uh, this story uh, seemed to be uh, a bit off. So, so later uh, reports actually showed that this was not entirely true, that a lot of neighbors actually didn't hear what was going on. But still, this story sparked basically the interest of a lot of social psychologists uh, into why we don't offer help when help is clearly needed. And it sparked a lot of research on what is now called the bystander effect. And the bystander effect basically means that we oftentimes don't offer help if we feel like an, a lot of other people are present as well and could as well uh, offer help. And I have a very, uh, I think, very illustrative uh, video clip to show you in which you will see uh, what this bystander effect uh, look like. So take a look. Plays like this street in New York City. If you were unfortunate enough to be the victim of a crime or taken ill unexpectedly, you might think that surrounded by all these people, someone would intervene. After all, isn't there safety in numbers? Psychologists say no. Research suggests that often a victim is less likely to receive assistance when surrounded by a group rather than a single bystander. When people are in a crowd, it's easier to pass the buck. It's what psychologists call the diffusion of responsibility. Liverpool Street Station in London, a busy thoroughfare for commuters. Uh, uh, Unknown to these uh, passers-by, Peter uh, is an actor. Uh, As part of an experiment on bystander uh, apathy, he's pretending uh, to be ill. Help, help. Uh, How long before he gets help? Help me. Help me. Help me. Helping would be inconvenient or even risky. He lies there for more than 20 minutes and no one raises an eyebrow. Please, somebody help me. It's always very distressing to watch situations like this where people are obviously suffering and no one's actually helping them. But what we have here is two conflicting rules. One is the rule that we ought to help and the other is the rule that we ought to do what everybody else is doing. And here you have a, a group of, effectively a group of strangers who are exerting the pressure not to intervene, not to help, and it's very difficult to rebel. Ruth, another actor, takes Peter's place. How long before she receives help? Four minutes later and 34 people have passed without stopping. Well, people don't really want to know that they just haven't got the time. Well, they have got the time, they just don't want to get involved. Unwittingly, these strangers have silently formed a temporary group with a rule, don't get involved. 
They're afraid to stand out from the crowd and won't take action if no one else does. This woman has clearly spotted Ruth, but she conforms to the rule and does nothing. Watch what happens, though, when someone else helps. You all right? You all right? Yes, thank you. you sure, you look a bit clicky, you know what I mean? She suddenly you finds sure? herself in a different group with a new rule to help. Uh, you want to sit up? She doesn't look well, does she? Uh, you all right? Yeah. Sure. First, I thought she was dead. Then I saw to check to see if she was breathing or not. And I looked around and I couldn't believe that no one had noticed her because there was a bloke sat there just absorbed in reading a newspaper. This time, Peter's dressed as a respectable gentleman. Now that his dress is in keeping with those around him, how long before he's rescued? Hello, sir. How are you today? I'm all right. Six thanks. seconds. <laughs> she even door? calls him sir, and suddenly no, everyone's fine. a good Samaritan. Do you suffer from epilepsy? No. Why you're lying on the floor in the rain? Because he's part of the right group. Everyone wants to help. I would just hate to be in his position of feeling ill um, and nobody helping and walking past, so I'd just like to check that he was okay. And I thought, well, it's wet, so he must really be ill because he's going to ruin his suit anyway. <laughs> so an important question is, of course, why does this bystander effect occur? Why, why don't we offer help when help is really needed and we are surrounded by other people that are not offering help as well? So there's two key explanations. The first one is diffusion of responsibility. That means, means that if there's a lot of other people present, the responsibility to help is diffused among a lot of people. So you feel like if there's only one person uh, uh, at, uh, at the scene, this person is responsible to offer help. There's no one else that could offer help. Well, with, if there's a lot of people there, you feel like, why should I be the one offering help? There's so many other people that could help as well. So you don't feel responsible anymore uh, for to offer help. And you start basically just looking at other people and think to yourself, well, why I don't have to help. Uh, this responsibility is not mine. Uh, the second reason is something that we already talked about. It's called pluralistic ignorance. And this is basically the experience that you're trying to read the minds of all the other people. And you think to yourself, I'm not really sure what to do. Uh, what, what are the rules here? Should I offer help? Yes or no? And you start looking at other people's faces and you think to yourself, well, probably everybody knows what's going on. There's probably nothing wrong here. I can just go on with my own business. And I'm probably the only one that's a bit upset by this. Um, and again, we, we talked about this before. This is just such a big thinking error. Thinking that other people have other thoughts than you and are not disturbed by something. Um, and this is also why uh, oftentimes in these situations, and that's also what we talked about in the smoke experiment when we talked about conformity, that it's so important to keep thinking for yourself. And if you are brave enough to interfere, you will likely see that a lot of people start helping you as well. So you won't end up being alone offering help. So the moment that one person decides to help, then more people will follow. Please keep this in mind uh, uh, for the future. So the bystander effect again shows that under ambiguous circumstances, when we don't really know what's going on, people search for cues on how to behave. And this is also very clear in the following study, which I think is a very smart study as well, in which uh, there were two actors on the street, uh, a man and a woman, and the man attacked the woman. It was not a real attack, it was fake, it were two actors. And the woman uh, responded in two different ways. The first response was that she started shouting and saying, what are, you, what are you doing? I don't know who you are, please go away. And the second one was, I don't know why I ever married you. Clearly sort of communicating that this was a person that she does not only know, but that it's actually her husband. And here, uh, the, the interesting question was, what do bystanders decide to do? Do they offer help, yes or no? And you see a whopping effect of uh, this, this response of the female. If she communicated that this was a stranger attacking her, uh, the majority of the bystanders actually started to offer help. While if she uh, communicated that this was her husband, then people stopped interfering because they felt like there's also a norm for privacy. I don't want to get involved. I don't know what's going on here. This is something that they have to settle themselves. So here you see that also a victim has quite some power uh, in this situation. The response really matters on uh, which, which type of reaction she will get from bystanders. 
So by now you've seen that there's actually a lot of examples that people oftentimes don't offer help when help is really needed. So what do we need to offer help? There's sort of several steps that we need to take. First of all, of course, you have to notice the event. You have to see what's going on. You have to look up from your phone and actually see that something is, is up, something is wrong. Then you have to interpret the event as an emergency. You have to see, okay, something is wrong and this is an emergency, this is not going well. Then you have to assume responsibility. You have to feel responsible for taking action. And then you also, the next step is that you have to know how to help. You have to actually feel like I know what, what I should be doing. And then finally, you have to make the decision to help. And with each of these steps, there's a likelihood that people do not help. And that's why helping is actually not as likely as we would assume based on all the motives that people have to help. So we have to move through all these different steps in order to uh, finally make a decision to help. And this is also key information for you, uh, both uh, when you're in a situation when you see that something is going on, that a person is in need, that you have to be very aware of all these steps and that sometimes you also have to skip some steps and you just have to be bold enough to interfere and to help others. It's also crucial information if you ever find yourself in need of help yourself. And of course, I hope this never ha happens to you, but if it does, I just wanna give you some key advice, what you can do if you are in distress yourself, or maybe you're actually in danger yourself. There's a lot of people there, but nobody's helping you. What should you do then? What can you do as a victim? Well, what is very important, first of all, is give people the feeling of responsibility. So if there's a lot of people there, don't simply scream for help, but say something like, uh, you man in the red coat, please help me. Then you address a certain individual and you make this person responsible for helping you. What is also helpful is making yourself known and saying something about what is going on in the situation. So that's what we saw with a woman being attacked and saying, I don't know who this person is. Please help me. I'm a student. I live there and there. Please help me. Uh, I don't know this person. This person is attacking me. So make clear, start communicating with the people around you and be very clear in what is going on and also say what you need. So make a concrete action plan for the bystanders in order for them to skip these steps. So you, you want them to feel responsible and also know what to do. So you can tell them basically, a uh, person in the red coat, please help me, call uh, 112, uh, I'm in need of help, I'm a student, or, you know, start, start screaming, start uh, giving out information. I, of course, I hope you never need this, but if you do, you now know what to do to increase the chances that you'll be, you will be helped if you really need it. So uh, this is the end of this lecture. Thank you.